again our next speaker, who is actually our first speaker of the day. Uh, I met him when uh, my son Julian graduated from Christendom College. Uh, I was staying in Front Royal at the uh, Hampton Inn and uh, uh, went out one evening to uh, smoke my pipe and uh, talk to my wife in an uninterrupted manner because we left all the screaming children up in the room. And uh, it was dark out there and there was another gentleman out there uh, enjoying what cannot be enjoyed in any public place. He was smoking as well. And uh, there we were, like a couple of criminals. <laughs> and uh, in the darkness and in the smoke, he said, are you Dale Alquist? <laughs> and, uh, and he turned out to be our next speaker. He was in, uh, in Front Royal because Christendom had just recently acquired a complete run of GK's Weekly. And he was there to study it because he wanted to read up more on distributism and on Chesterton's ideas on distributism. And he has since then become the uh, founder and president of the uh, Society for Distributism. He's the editor of the Distributist Review and uh, really one of the great spokesmen and most articulate uh, people who understands distributism. And, and it is an idea that really is catching attention because of the complete and utter failure of our present economy. So uh, you'll, you'll really enjoy his talk and it was fun to finally see him in the light of day for the first time <laughs> yesterday. I know what he looks like now. I, I never actually saw his face that night even though we talked for about an hour. Please welcome Richard Ailman. Who wants some more coffee? You're going to need it. By the way, my country won the World Cup for the first time in the history of my nation, so I'm very happy about that. Everybody knows who Paul the Octopus is or heard of Paul the Octopus? He predicted every single match correctly, and I think we should make him senior economic advisor to President Obama. Dear friends in Christ, the title of my talk today is The Mistake About Distributism. And what I want to do is I want to cover two areas in particular. First, some popular misconceptions about what distributism is and isn't. And the second thing I want to do is give you a brief about the state of distributism today. Where are we? What are we doing? What are we up to? And the future of the movement. Especially what I really want to talk about is action. Now, how many of you consider yourselves distributists? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you know what distributism is? Well, that, that's good because that means I don't have to bore you with a long introduction to distributism. I can bore you with a short one. Okay. Distributism finds its roots in the social and economic theories articulated in the documents of the Church's social teaching beginning with Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum. These social encyclicals raise imperatives on economic transaction and its relation to labor, solidarity, wages, the wide diffusion of ownership, and the proper limits of technology. Distributism is an economic system compliant with these principles and is centered on the widest possible ownership of property as the best guarantee of political and economic freedom. A family that owns its own land or its own tools can make its way in the world without being dependent on someone else for a job. Thus, distributism seeks to extend property ownership both for private and social use as widely as possible and end the concentration of ownership by few capitalists or state officials. So we want neither wage slavery nor slavery to the state. To quote the late Archbishop Sheen, history reveals that never has there been any tyranny, never has there been slavery in a country where there has been a wide distribution of property. 
So I've called today's talk The Mistake About Distributism because I want to address some of the common errors I've come across over the years since my involvement in distributism. Some of these I call mistakes and others I call them fairy tales. Now the first mistake about distributism is that it's just another form of capitalism. And a lot of people want me to just admit that distributism is another form of capitalism, so I've decided that you know what, maybe if it makes everybody happy, I'll say that distributism is just like capitalism. Except that we differ on the nature of man, the purpose of economic activity, usury, the maximization of token wealth, the role and legitimate exercise of the state, empirical economics, the meaning of subsidiarity, subordination of economics to the higher sciences, our ends, our means, what money is, what wealth is, what free market is, production and consumption, regulation, free trade, the moral and divine law and the social and economic order, and yes, what liberty means. <laughs> we're just a bunch of capitalists. Now, for those who think we're just a bunch of socialists, you can take that and add Obama. <laughs> now, Chesterton had a profound respect for the worker, and so do we. Man is not simply an individual, but he is social in nature, and for the benefit of the common good, he should organize in order to protect vital common interests. So most distributors admire the work of economist Father Heinrich Pesch and the solidarity system of human work. In fact, we view solidarity not as foreign to distributism, but rather complementary. Distributism does not view the hiring of labor by capital as intrinsically immoral, nor as something that would be eradicated by the distributive state. Rather, Chesterton and distributors hold that there should exist harmony between capital and labor. However, for that harmony to exist, there have to be three conditions. First, workers cannot be seen as a factor or cost, but rather as essential partners in the production process. Two, workers must be given a living wage and a just contract. And three, a good society is one where, for the sake of the individual and the common good, the worker has a choice to own or to seek employment. As Chesterton said it perfectly, he said, we believe that unless the great majority of men in a country own their home, the ground it stands on and their means of livelihood, the citizens of that country cannot be free. We do not insist that a man must own, we insist that he shall be given the choice and that at any moment it shall be easy for him to become an owner. So the conflict between employer and employee doesn't have to exist, it's not inevitable. However, so long as these tensions do exist, so long as man exists in a condition where he is forced to work for a wage, without the choice to decide whether he will use his talents as an owner or labor under an employer, we will continue to call our present system what it is, wage slavery. Now, the next thing is that distributors do not believe in competition. Now, the theory of competition is defined as a contest between two or more forces which cannot share the same space. The common man, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than a doggy -e dog world divorced from the Gospels, distributors would pro properly define competitive forces as cooperative, based on mutual survival rather than destruction, the natural forces of creativity and uniqueness rather than the undermining of businesses in the same market or the monopolizing of the marketplace. So let me give you an example. I, I uh, as Dale said, I come from Spain. I've, I've lived here half of my life, half of my life in Spain. And in my town in Spain, we have two bakeries. They're right across from each other. Okay. One does not have a sign saying, they're Satan, and that's, that's Hell's Kitchen, nor we're going to reduce prices 40 or 80% uh, in order to try to undermine our competitor. One was started in the 50s. The other one was started, uh, I think, in the 80s. And they're still there. How is it possible that they still coexist? simply because some people prefer the croissants in one bakery and the bread in another. So that is, composition should be natural. It should be based on your own uniqueness and your own creativity. Anybody who's an artist knows exactly what I'm talking about. Artists are not trying to shove, uh, not trying to say, don't, don't enjoy the art from this person over here. Enjoy my art. Nobody, no, nobody does that. So competition can be healthy. Now the next mistake about distributism is that distributism is dying. Now, some think tanks, they say that distributism is a corpse, that it's on the decline, and that it's a fairy tale. But if distributism is dying, then how odd to watch a group of people devote so much energy to beating a dead horse. If their proposition is true, 
then it is also true that they spent over two years publishing books, articles, pamphlets, dedicated precious conference time just to prove that a fairy tale is an extinct fairy tale. The reality is that being a distributist in the 21st century is more exciting than ever. And now I have some things to, some little aids here. Publishing world. In the publishing world, we have the reprints of Chesterton and the distributists. For example, we have the Outline of Sanity. Uh, we have Economics for Helen. Uh, one of the best books, if you like, Belloc's The Servile State, a restoration on the essay, uh, an essay on the restoration of property. And Father McNabb's Nazareth or Social Chaos. Now, by the way, all these books are available upstairs on the IHS table. So these books are just, the classics are, classics are being reprinted for a reason. People are, are interested in looking to alternatives. Now let's look at some of the more contemporary. I don't happen to have a copy on me of Joseph Pierce's Schumacher Renaissance, Small is Still Beautiful, but let's look at that book and the impact it had. And it had an impact on the secular world as well, not just the Christian world. Uh, we also have, for example, Dr. Race Matthews, Jobs of Our Own. If you are interested in cooperatives, Mondragon, again, this is distributism up to date. And I don't have a copy because it was just released, but the ISI um, published book by John Madai toward a truly free market, a distributist perspective on the role of government, taxes, and health care. So now we have distributism up to date. It's no longer just, again, the reprints, which, which are very important, but also, where are we today and looking at it from a contemporary lens. We have Dale Alquist. Dale Alquist appears on EWTN. I'm here because Dale Alquist talked about distributism on EWTN. Now, you may think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but that depends how this ends. But anyway, <clears throat> online we have hundreds of web pages, sites, and blogs exploring distributist thought, including the thought of the Chester Belloc, Wendell Berry, Schumacher, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and of course Mondragon and Father Jose Maria Arizmendarieta. Now that's a tough name to say for me too because I'm not Basque. I'm from another part of Spain. Okay, we have the Society for Distributism chaired by Thomas Stork, John Medai, and myself. Uh, we were invited last year to participate in probably the first ever capitalist socialist distributist debate. And that was against Michael Novak and Dr. Charles Clark. So what, what about distributism overseas? Again, is this, does this sound like we're dying so far? Does it sound like distributism is dying? To you, it doesn't sound like it to me. Now, what about overseas? We have the Sierra Leone Chesterton Center. They're teaching Africans how to apply distributist cooperative methods to their agrarian economy, giving them the tools. What about in the UK? Anybody here, Philip Blonde? Red Tories? Okay. Well, Philip Blunt is taking the UK by storm, um, and he openly talks about distributism, talks about Chesterton, Belloc, he name drops, he has no problem with it. And he's played an influential role in the political philosophy of the brand new, newly elected Prime Minister David Cameron, who by the way now is trying to break up healthcare in the UK, really trying to create a distributist form of healthcare. And that's about time, too. Um, Romania. Last year, John Madai spent the summer in Romania talking to them. They're very interested in distributism. He's been on national television in the, in the news. He's helping them because they're really interested in adopting a distributist model to their economic, uh, their economic system. We also have Thomas More College. And they just announced last week that they were creating a new Catholic medieval guild program so that students can learn the skills and inner workings of the guild system. According to, and he's a distributist by the way, president of Thomas More College, Dr. William Fahey, not only will students learn skills they can use throughout their lives, they will have an opportunity to bake bread for the homeless, produce icons for local churches, create chairs, cribs, and other projects for the poor and needy in our community, and bring music to nursing homes and hospitals. Friends, distributism is not dying. Some people are just nervous. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to try something a little bit different when I came here. One of the, the main things I wanted to do is answer the mistake or the objection that distributism cannot be done. You know, any, I, I really believe that given our political climate today, I mean, when you have the government rating small family farms, 
and um, benefiting GMOs and Monsanto and all these different organizations that are producing unhealthy food and they're mass producing food, that the way to change things is to actually change them. That means you have to change culture. It means you have to start creating an organization. And that means everybody, especially mothers, because I think that mothers are really the educators of the family. So given our, our present climate, it's not enough to resist. It, it, we need to resist. But it's not enough to resist by yelling at the television set or by going online and, and being, you know, getting upset over things that you see. You have to actually do something. So what I'm trying to say is, how do we start distributism? Um, from my experience, I think the American Chesterton Society is a great example. I mean, you have the American Chesterton Society, you have societies all over the country talking about Chesterton, getting together, meeting. Right here, we have the DC Chesterton Society. Let's put this together along with the American Chesterton Society in Minneapolis. So we begin with the study group, and um, where's Bob Cook? Bob? I don't know if he's here. I don't know if I can. Oh, Bob, there you are. Now, Bob, you have a, a Chesterton, you have a group, a Chesterton Society. Very small. And you're also talking to them about distributism, right? I think you're, so, I mean, that's a great example right there. So if we begin with a study group using local Chesterton societies as models, I mean, you guys have not only accomplished, uh, I mean, a television show, all these different societies, but also you've just created a school. I mean, I don't know if you realize the impact of what you've actually accomplished. It's tremendous. And you should be teaching a lot of people about organization, let me tell you. Um, so study groups dedicated to Chesterton already exist, but what are these new groups formed, meeting once a week to learn the economic science and philosophy of distributism? What if you asked your local parish if some space might be in, reserved on ch church premises so that your group can be a visible manifestation of faith, attracting others and building new leaders? I get emails all the time some from young people, uh, hey, I just finished my political master's degree, I'm going to run as a Democrat in my town or as a Republican in my town but on a distributist platform. So believe me, this is having an impact, and you can have an impact, especially if anybody's a teacher here. Anybody here is a teacher? Teachers? You know what it's like five years, ten years down the line, you find out one of your students did something. They started a business. They became a politician. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but uh, necessarily. But they, they made some significant impact in your community, in the state, or even in the country. So study groups, I think, really are, are one way. It's a microwave, but it's a way to start. So what if after six months of study, examining these books, reading the early distributors, reading contemporary distributors, you begin to examine the successes and the losses and the failures of your local community. This can lead to the development of political and social activism, educational efforts, the creation of socially conscious businesses, and even nonprofits instrumental in the development of the distributors program. What if homeschoolers, who are already educational distributors, what if they taught their children distributism? What if an economic, Economics for Helen series could be adopted and grafted into the homeschool program? I mean, for our part, I, I can tell you that next month, we are going to be starting uh, on the Distributors Review. We're going to be doing something. We're going to be working on a project that we call it the Distributors Catechism. And what that is is an attempt to try to bring together and consolidate a Q&A uh, that is extensive enough for average people to read, to understand, to pass on to their friends, and it's going to be absolutely free. Now, there are many different things. I wanted to talk to you today about microcredit lending, and I wanted to talk about community land trusts, and I wanted to talk about a lot of different things that we could do, both that would benefit the agrarian and even, to some degree, um, the city, the ur urban life. But due to time, I think I'd rather um, talk about something else. A lot of people think the mistake about distributism is that we cannot meet large-scale manufacturing and technological needs, nor can we rebuild the agricultural sector, especially given GMOs and the problems that are existing. Uh, and I want to say yes and no, that's, that's, there's some truth to that, there is some error to that. Without a doubt, distributism started as an agrarian economy, but at the heart of distributism is a decentralist system. Dis distributors wish to restore localism, the local economy, local production, for local consumption. Besides wages and the conditions of employment already mentioned, the reason the distributors were critical about mass production is because it took away from decentralized production. For Chesterton, an economy dominated by mass-produced goods 
could never replace the strength of a decentralized economy. Because ownership diversification also means self-reliance for small towns and for small country. Local production for local consumption is a policy enabling the flow of an extensive variety of goods and services created by and sustaining the very the community that makes them. Chesterton recognized how the powerful concentration of the mass production system severed widespread ownership, augmented the nation's reliance on industry for its gross domestic product, challenged the power of the state in size and influence. Well, how? Through subsidies, for example, through rescues, through becoming such a large portion of the GDP that we all depend on these certain businesses, these certain factories, or the financial economy, too big to fail. But Chesterton predicted this back then. He knew it right away. He could see it coming. He, he saw the influence that mass production had. Rather, what he wanted is a community that was producing its own goods, not everything. Some things would come outside the local community. But those essential and important goods, this way become creating a sort of a system where you had a wide distribution of wealth. Now, why, why again, why did he have a problem with the factory or with mass producing generally is because usually when they collapsed, so do we. Unable to compete with the bargaining and lobbying powers of the factory, local production suffered as mass producers increasingly became the sole source of wealth for local communities, paid unjust wages and unjust contracts to the worker, eliminated the ownership society, and without loyalty to king or country, factories packed up and moved for greener pastures, leaving small towns in ruin, as has become evident today in the United States. So what is the distributor's answer to our automotive, tech, and other large-scale manufacturing? I mean, certainly we don't want mom and pop to make our cars. It would be pretty difficult to do that. Cooperatives are the answer, worker ownership. So cooperatives are worker-owned businesses. Now, when I say cooperatives, I know a lot of people start to think, what do you mean by a cooperative? That sounds kind of weird. It may sound even socialist or communist. It sounds like a collective. A cooperative is simply this. It's the easiest way to explain it. It's a multi-partnership. The difference is that in other multi-partnerships, like law firms, for example, you have employees. In this case, the employees are the owners. So whether the business suffers losses or gains, cooperative owners risk just like any other business. Let's say, for example, five of you here in front wanted to open up a bar. Okay, if you wanted to open up a bar, you, you'd come up with a business plan. Each of you would decide how much capital investment you would need to put into the business. You would buy, you would buy it, you would run it and operate it yourselves. You wouldn't have employees. You would be the employees and the owners. How do you make decisions? That varies. It could be democratically, it could be by majority rule, or it can be unanimous vote. But in the end, everybody's risking they risk the profit or loss the same as any other business. They are not operated by the government. They're not subsidized by the government. It's just a private business. It's just a multi-partnership. So cooperatives are the distributors answer to utility companies, construction, automotive, industry, insurance, healthcare, and even law firms. Cooperatives are the answer to NAFTA, restoring the made in the USA label, mobilizing workers whose jobs have been shipped overseas, raising American domestic production from the ashes. Because our production is down the tubes right now. Instead of one person raising capital to incorporate and invest in overhead, the cooperative is a shared investment by several people injecting capital. Now, the most successful cooperative in the world, how many of you have heard of Mondragon Cooperative Corporation? It's from the Basque country in Spain. They usually have revenues in excess of 16 billion annually. And they're made up of small cooperatives, 300 cooperatives under one umbrella called Mondragon. Okay, now I don't want to spend too much time on Mondragon, but I did want to say one more thing, that Mondragon has been in talks with US steel workers to actually work on worker ownership. And so that, there's a possibility that that may bear some very good fruit. Where else are cooperatives succeeding? In any Italians here or of Italian descent? Okay. Emilia Romana is in Bologna. Okay. And they have many, many different cooperatives. When you put together what they make for Bologna, they make 45% GDP. 
45% GDP, they're very successful. Now, some people will say, that's very nice, it's Europe, this is America. No, I mean, that's fair. Bless you. But I want to say something about that. There, according to the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, there are over 400 cooperatives right here in our soil. Okay, from the fishing industry to education, worker-owned businesses should be a distributist model for America in the 21st century. Now, we don't want everything to be a cooperative. This is just for large or medium-scale manufacturing, for construction, again, for utility companies, even local utility companies. It makes perfect sense. Now, the next mistake about distributism is that you cannot change the present culture. And the late Dr. William Marrow once said that philosophers define the world, and this is also true of G.K. Chesterton. He understood action, and through his work and organization, over 24 branches of the Distributist League were founded across the United Kingdom. Others, the Catholic Land Movement, and by the way, Tim Elin has just restarted the Catholic Land Movement right here in the United States. So if you go upstairs to the IHS press table, you will see a sign there, go talk to him. This is a very interesting project about building communities. So when we talk about action, action is, of course, coupled with prayer, fasting, the practice of virtue, and the need for grace. But it is a necessary ingredient for change. I want to quote for a minute a really great little book. It's about $1.50 if you can find it. It's called A Christian Political Party Now by Albert C. Walsh. And he says, people follow the leader. And if the principal political leader of a country is a devout Christian, the people tend to imitate his good example. His political party enables him to reform civil society in favor of Christianity and begin the construction of a, Christ of a Christian social order. Um, one of my, if you ever get a chance, another book, I know I'm just dropping book titles here, but if you get a chance to read, there's a book by Douglas Hyde. He is a former communist. Uh, he became a convert to Catholicism. He wrote, the, well, he didn't write this book. He actually gave a talk at Notre Dame University, and they created a book out of the transcript. They made it. And something he said that really stood out of my mind is he said one of the biggest problems with communism in the early 20th century was able to acquire more recruits to communism in the UK than the Catholic Church was able to recruit Catholics or converts into, into the church. And he said one of the reasons is that for America, um, English or British Catholicism stopped outreaching. Everything was internalized. Everything was come to my conference, come let's preach to the choir. And preaching to the choir is important, but you also have to reach out to other people. So the failure to outreach is one of the biggest problems when it comes to the progressives, progressives have no problem doing it. They just, they, they're, they're a little bit cautious, but they throw caution to the wind and they tackle it. They, they get out there. We do not. And that was one of the biggest failures, I believe, of the 20th century, is that we do not do that. Some, some do. There are some groups that do. But generally speaking, we do not. So I was at a talk at a, a pre-conference lunch, and I'm sitting there you know, with a uh, Monsignor and some other people. And he was really upset because the Right to Life Party had, had not succeeded in New York. And uh, I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, we had conferences. Well, we had lunch. We had prayer breakfast. I said, all right. But I said, did you go to the street? Did you just get a table and maybe just, you know, with some pamphlets, talk to people and hand them out? No. Did you go to the mall? No. I said, well, that's, that's why you didn't succeed. You see... You have to outreach. We have to do what's uncomfortable in the 21st century. Now, I, I, I'm former military, so I do not believe ever in telling people or asking them to do something I'm not willing to do. And this fall, I will be getting a table, and I'm going to be in New York City, and I'm going to go to all the colleges, and I'm going to talk to people. And I think that's what we all, should all be doing. Now, finally, rather than summarize, I prefer to make a statement. I've been told that when I write, I don't write enough from the heart. So let me speak from the heart. I came back from four years in the Marines to find my mother losing her small business to the politics of the left and right, and an economic philosophy that shrugged its shoulders as small business, the lifeblood of this country, by the way, collapsed under unfair regulations, outsourcing, and the favoring of big business. 
Capitalists and socialists either pontificate about fl how flaws in the system are the nature of the beast and not an organic consequence of basic assumptions, or they smile at you and they say, hey, it's better than communism. Rather than choose the lesser of two evils, I believe we have a duty to provide people with something good. Not utopia. I mean, distributors recognize fallen man. Nothing is neat and tidy and perfect. And nobody is suggesting that a distributist economy or a distributist state would be perfect. But at least we wouldn't at least we recognize the fallen man while theorists of the invisible hand of God let God sort it out in the end. No, I'm sorry, not this time. We reject the age of the enlightenment and any society divorced from the gospels. We want something more and we're going to build it. We choose to be leaders in our communities because we believe in the future of our people and we insist on the state of affairs acknowledging the visible hand of God. We want something true for our children not so, they can, not so they can have more, but so they can be more. The defensive posturing of the 20th century will not do. No war has ever been won on the defensive. We must be cautious, but we must not fail to see that our present disorder stems from groups who are not overly cautious. They don't, they don't wait for your permission. 50 years ago, so when people say that culture can't change, 50 years ago, if I would have said to you, one day, People are going to be serious about the rights and lifestyles of people dressing in skirts, of men dressing in skirts. What would you have said? No, wait, not, it's not going to happen. The question is, are you going to allow it to be imposed on you, or are you going to do something about it? Either we can allow others to dictate our future, or we can rise to the challenges before us and lead the nation. Indeed, Christians should be the leaders in the 21st century popular movement it is unrealistic for us to be separated politically by tribal ideologies that have failed us. This movement will champion the rights of the unborn, rally against torture and euthanasia, and it will stand up for economics as if families, and more importantly, as if God mattered. Because we believe that justice is not only owed to one another and to the dignity of peoples, but above all, it is owed to God. We urge the pro-life movement to adopt distributist economics so that while we may never diminish the intrinsic evil that is abortion, the pro-life apologists may be well-rounded and able to provide an economic basis for social reform which can persuade those pr presently opposed to life. Abortion will always be the crown jewel. We've never cr compromised on that, but there's no reason that we can't also have a, an economic and social policy subordinate to that. No man is an island. True self-sufficiency recognizes that we cannot simply fend for ourselves because man is a social animal by nature. Localism in the cottage industry is about our households and communities, the rural town, urban dwellers, real life and real people. Thus we seek political reform based on independence for the family and social interdependence, subsidiarity, solidarity, distributive justice, and the favoring of the wide distribution of title ownership. Friends, the 21st century should be the beginning of an old and new procession, one that raises the scarlet flag of our savior and recognizes his authority, champions his weakest, the poor, destitute, and the propertyless in the name of the social reign of Christ the King. This new movement will not stand for prejudices against the poor, the unemployed, and the destitute. Make no mistake about it. We will not let them rot. Instead, we will support and build new organizations, new houses of hospitality for the naked and hungry in the tradition of Dorothy Day, giving the disenfranchised material and immaterial blankets. This nation doesn't have to be the place where the farmer loses his dreams, but where he can feed, where he can feed and teach us how to feed the future. Thus, we will build the facilities to teach husbandry, stewardship, political economy, and the knowledge to attract a new generation of farmers, environmentalists, and good stewards. To those academic activists, join us. Help us draw the blueprints from which we can build a new tomorrow. For the common man, become leaders in your communities. 
Families, march with us so that one day you can tell your children that you played a part in a movement of mothers and daughters, fathers and sons, small business owners, cooperative owners, thousands and millions who might one day stand in front of Congress with pictures of Chesterton and signs that read, you didn't do it for us, we created jobs of our own. Friends, I choose a visible manifestation of faith over the armchair. I choose not to walk away as Nero burns Rome, but to turn around, follow my master as he walks back toward the flames. Join us. There's a fire, and we intend to put it out. Thank you very much.